commercial ads began picking up these sayings. But one of the popular sayings about a year ago, the kids, was let's get it all together. Let's get my head together. Let's get it all together. And it was always getting it all together. One of the big problems the kids had was they didn't have the pieces to get together. They had nothing to get together, but that was another problem. This is the problem we're faced with. You talk about a coalition. <coughs> you talk about getting it all together. First, you've got to build each piece. By the time you build each piece, the situation for getting together will be far different from anything that could be envisaged at a strategy meeting here. Furthermore, unless you build each piece and you've got each piece, you've got nothing to get together. And this is the job ahead. For each section of your community, start organizing among yourselves. The black section organize. Organize as far as the Indians go. Organize as far as the blue collars go. Organize as far as the middle, middle class go. Don't worry about where you're going to go after that. Get those first pieces moving. It's very interesting the way the things that you do at a particular time shape out what's going to happen a little later. Now, you can do it here. This is a, you've got a tremendous tradition out in this part of the state. I don't know whether, how many of you are aware of it. Uh, just curious, how many of you kids are uh, Minnesota natives? Just put up your hands. All right, now, I'm going to ask you something, and put up your hands, because, and don't, try, don't think you're back in a college classroom where you can pull that bluffing crap, you know? Because I'm going to call on you. <laughs> How many of you kids know about Floyd Olson? Really, about Floyd Olson's administration in Minnesota, and the Farmer Labor Party here. You know about Floyd Olson? Vaguely, no. What do you mean, vaguely? You either know or you don't know. No. What? You don't know. Go back and read the biographies of Floyd Olson for one thing. You will, some of you people will say to us, you know, we should go back. We go back in Illinois reading Altfeld and Lincoln and so on. Read this guy Olson. Go back into your own traditions, because your own traditions is where you'll be working through and out of. Start bringing up your old traditions, your militant traditions, you know? Not some of the crap you've got around here. Jesus, you know, you've got a mayor that, uh, even in Chicago, we wouldn't put him in as a dog catcher. You know? <laughs> you've got some. I, you know, it's been a very funny state. I remember I came up here once to organize and foots around in South St. Paul, and I ran into a mayor that, or to a lawyer that I wondered who was going to take care of him, you know, as in terms of his so-called abilities. Well, you wind up, well, you took care of him. You made him governor of your state. Yeah. <laughs> you've, got, uh, you've got a screwy uh, state in many ways. <laughs> but you've got also some tremendous things going for with you. Okay, now what do you want to do? Shall we all go home, or do you want to have some questions? What do you want to do? Why don't, why don't you give a chance to ask us a question? Would you like to ask us a question? <clears throat> Let me ask you one question before I go. How many, do all of you live in this section of South uh, Minneapolis? No. What do you mean, no? Paul. What? Paul. You're from St. Paul? Yeah. How many of you are from St. Paul? Put up your hand. Twin what? It's a Twin Cities. What? It's a Twin Cities. Don't give me the Twin, give me the twin Cities stuff. <laughs> how, how come you St. Paul's uh, people came over here? See you. <laughs> I'm touched. See you in attraction. Jim. That's what? Jim? <laughs> <laughs> like it's just plain water, isn't it? Because I did. <laughs> I did get into one of these situations where I thought the other party was kidding. You know, I took a mouthful and turned out a beach in. <laughs> All right, go ahead.
and I see the current women's movement as part of it. <clears throat> well, let me, let me tell you this. The question is, when I was talking about the pieces, I didn't say anything about women's, or the part that women will play in this thing. Uh, I, there were a number of groups. I, if you may remember, I talked about senior citizens. I talked about 19-year-olds. I talked about the, uh, the blue-collar uh, uh, hard hat group and just sort of left it after that. When you're talking about middle-class organization, as I've been talking, you are talking about woman power to a degree far beyond anything that has been advanced by women's lead. Let me explain to you just what I mean. If you, you will go into the tactics, which I outlined in, uh, well, in this last book I wrote, this Rules for Radicals, or if you read the Playboy interview of last month, uh, in which there are a number of these tactics, you will note that the tactics, such as the savings bank tactic, for example, one, one. Is anybody here that works in a bank? <laughs> must be. I think they're afraid to admit it. Uh, a number of these tactics, they're done during the working hours, banking hours, say. I'm just using the bank for one thing. Now, this involves a mass invasion of a bank with about, say, 5,000 or 6,000 people all cooperating with the banks. You see, our, a, a large part of our own strategy of fighting is to make the, organ, the establishment, the enemy, live up to the, their own expectations. If you give them what they want plus more, you can kill them with them. <laughs> also, if you demand that they, uh, they live by their own book of rules, it's like demanding that the Christian church be Christian, which they can't be, you know. Now, the banks, savings banks all over the country, for example, advertise for savings accounts. And they offer in the ads, uh, food blenders, portable radios, this. Do they do that up here in Minnesota? You open an account? Okay. So what you do is you take about 5,000 people with your uh, $5 a piece, say, and you go in there to open up a savings account. Now that immediately ends all banking business for the day because nobody can move in the bank. You got every, every step, uh, you know, the whole place is jam-packed. If you've ever opened a savings account, you know that they always have one of the multiple uh, vice presidents or assistants and so on who sits down with you and starts off filling out a card on your mother's maiden name and all that stuff, you know. It usually takes about 15 to 20 minutes. And that, everything is jammed. Nobody can move in the whole bank, you know. Well, they, and at the same time, they call the police, but there's nothing they can do about it. You know, this isn't a mass sit-in. The bank is advertised asking you to come in and open an account. So you all came down to open an account. What are they going to do, bust you for it? No, look pretty ridiculous. So sooner or later, the bank president is going to move in and say, who's, you know, who's running this show? You know, what do you want? Why? And so forth. And you're off and running. Now, this occurs during banking hours. During banking hours, when you're operating a middle-class tactic, the men are employed. Everything that I've told you about this on this particular tactic, these are all women. And the organizers are going to be women, trained women organizers. Now, what I'm saying to you is that in tactic after tactic, in move after move, in middle class organization, woman power is going to be at a top, top, top premium. This is why in the cities that I will speak in, say recently, a couple of weeks ago in Cincinnati, all the women's lib groups come out for the meeting and all completely behind it. And it's during that meeting that, that they will bury the acts that, because uh, they've got some feuds and factions going on between them, as, you know, as all groups have. But that is where woman power enters. It will be a major prime force. Okay? No? no? All right. Come on. Uh, Where's the no? Go ahead. Sounds sort of sexist to me. You just imply that, that that's the limit of women's ability is to go down and open savings accounts. Oh, come on. Uh, boy, if that's the way I've communicated, if that's your interpretation, that all I imply that that's the limit of women going down there, well, we just are not, we're just not communicating.
That's right, we're not. Okay. All right, what's the next question? How much smaller can you give a machine and what significance of any is the what would projections you make in terms of hammer handling? Hammer hand thickness. Well how many people here are at all familiar with the name of Hanrahan or the politics or the victory? Put your hands way up so that I know that I'm not just talking to a few. Well, I'd say it's about, uh, about what, a fifth? About a fifth of the people here are sort of uh, familiar with it, so I'll, I'll therefore make my answer sort of short. First, you, you've got two questions. On a daily machine, the daily machine has been changing a good deal. Uh, in terms of uh, over the last four years, because the days of the ethnic groups, the days of the kind of precinct, precinct captain operation, the days where Chicago was noted for its particular kind of machine, those days uh, are dead and we're in the last residuals. Daly's the last of that whole period. The period when the great machines were the Kelly machine in Chicago, the Curley machine in Boston, the Hague machine in Jersey City, and the Pendergast machine in Kansas City. In Chicago, the Kelly machine made the Daly machine look like the Junior League, believe me. In Chicago, when Election Day would come around during the Kelly administration, uh, it was a day of such religious import that the world had never seen its like because we had a massive resurrection. All the dead in our, all of our cemeteries <laughs> arose and voted, you know. We didn't bother counting ballots so much. We were weighing them in those days. <laughs> now, Kelly, but those days were over with. And what, those, what they were based on primarily was that it was still part of the whole immigrant period and, and what precinct captains were doing was delivering a service to you. And when they delivered a service, they asked you in return to just uh, vote for their ticket. That was all the payment. And that, that's what organizations were built on, payoffs on the gratitude uh, for a service which, uh, uh, which a precinct captain has done for you. Now, the, with the whole business of the changing city, the urban sprawls, the this, the that, the suburbs, and so on, the machine days were gone. Now, this is a different scene from the Hanrahan thing. Hanrahan, when he got dumped off the ticket, Hanrahan, you may remember, was in the state's attorney killing of this uh, Chicago Panther, Black Panther, and all, all the stuff that went with him. When uh, he was dropped off the ticket, he had been originally put on by Daly. Daly only dropped him off because of a lot of pressure. To a lot of people in Chicago, and remember, state's attorney is a county position. That means that the suburbs are in on the voting. A lot of the people were very much against the Panthers, and this business of the shooting was something that they were in favor of, plus the fact that with a lot of crimes which were occurring, uh, Uh, were, as they were just teeny boppers, so to speak, and so on, the civil rights struggle was on, and they got quite turned on. And when they got to college, they approached the black students with their arms open, literally, you know, let's get together, and so on and so forth. And they found themselves being rebuffed and rejected. Because in the last three years, you've had, three or four years, you've had this black separatism and on college groups. Last week, I was at the University of Northern Illinois, and, uh, and the white students there, this, yeah, these are the activist students, mind you, uh, said, uh, that when I said, well, where are the blacks? Well, the blacks never come out when we have white speakers here. Uh, and as a matter of fact, Jesse Jackson came out here last week, and whites were barred from being admitted into the room to listen to him speak. Now, what you've been getting has been a reaction on a part of these white students who have been, whose feelings have been so hurt at being rebuffed and rejected that they've turned away and said, yeah, I see heads nodding, and said, okay, you want to play it that way? You stay over there, that's where you want to be? We'll stay over here. 
And this is worse than trying to deal with the racists because they won't come out with it, because they don't want to talk about it, because they're, uh, uh, they just, uh, the minute I start talking to them about it, they'll do everything, change the subject to Indians, to Mexican Americans, to sh moonshots, anything, to, but to get away from the subject. Now, it's one thing, you know, the separatist business, which is, I think, beginning, at least from what I've been saying, it's beginning to crack up now. But it's one thing for it to serve as this great rationale for the Southern racists. I don't know whether any of you read that, that statement in uh, one of the interviews of the editors of Harper's Magazine with me, which uh, uh, was, is in that paperback and it's called The Professional Radical by the editors of Harper's, where I tell the episode of uh, being in a dining room about a year and a half ago or two years ago in Shreveport, Louisiana. The year before that, the, or two years before that, there had been quite a scene there where the Klan had gotten me outside of town. It was a very sticky, close one. And as I'm eating, my waiter, the black waiter, leans over and he puts down something and while his head is down, he says, Mr. Olinsky, don't look up now, but that man in a brown suit coming in with those two other men is the leader of the clan that had you out on, outside of town that night. And then he just went back. And about two minutes later, I heard my voice being called, or a minute later before I even had a chance to look up. And there's this guy in a brown suit. And he's saying, uh, Mr. Olinsky, you don't know me, but I know you. And I just want to tell you that when you call us white Southerners, when you use words like, oh, you know, you call us goddamn racist bigots, bastards, and all those other names you call us, you're just wrong. Because we're not that. Now, I've been reading in the papers about those black students up north who want separate dormitories and separate eating tables in the cafeteria and separate this and separate that. And I'm just telling you, I believe as an American and the right of every American to do what he wants to. And I'm willing to fight to the death for their right to have separate tables and separate <laughs> dormitories and separate things. Now, okay, so all you can do is look at them and say, oh, lousy bastard. What are you going to say to them? But that situation, at least you can buck and fight over against this other one through the country of these graduating seniors who have been hurt and hurt badly. The kind of scene, uh, I mean, labored a couple of, on a couple of other things. And a kind of scene where you're talking to a black student and, uh, you know, you're talking up and down, you're just having a ball talking, and all of a sudden he goes into a freeze on you. And at first you don't know, well, what the hell's happened? Then you look up the walk on campus and there are four blacks coming down the walk. And you know what the score is right away. I mean, immediately, if that guy keeps on laughing with you, those other four are gonna say to him when they pass by, what are you doing, suck holding whitey, you know? So forth, so he goes and goes into the sprees. Now, it's that kind of, uh, of situation which is uh, it's a very bad deal. It's almost inversely as bad as uh, what was going on the other way and is still going on the other way. Remember I was talking to you about communication. This is important for you to know because you've got a black population in this section of South Minneapolis that you're going to be working with. And one of the problems on communication and let me, tell, let me give it to you in the form of an anecdote. Uh, three years ago, I'm giving a lecture at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge. The university is having a dinner in my honor at the faculty club just before the lecture with departmental heads. I'm in that private dining room with them. It's all white. A black enters the room. He's about 29 or 30, well-dressed, comes steaming up to me. We look at each other, and it turns out that he was the head of Friends of SNCC. Any of you remember SNCC? Remember that organization? In Chicago, and we had 
we've done a lot of things together and we were very close. And so after embracing and all that, we got off into a give and take, you know, what's he been doing and what's going on? Well, he's getting his doctorate in education at Harvard, which is right next door to MIT. And we're going up and down talking for 20 minutes and suddenly he stops and I stop. And we look around and here are all these departmental heads, all these white guys standing there, looking down and very ill at ease. And we realize what's happened. Here I am at a dinner in my honor given by these guys. We're not, but we haven't paid any attention to them. Haven't even talked to them. And before I could say anything, my black friend instead turns to them and says, look, I'm the one who should apologize. First of all, I, I don't even go to MIT. Secondly, I wasn't invited here. <coughs> but I, I just have to try, to try to make you understand why I had to come here. As you know, I've known Saul before. But I can't tell you what it meant that I had to see him and talk to him, and I don't know whether I can make you understand it. Let me try. So we've been talking here for 20 minutes, and twice you have heard him say to me, oh, Jesus, are you full of shit? You heard him say that. You don't know what that meant to me. <laughs> because how, how can I explain it to you? I've been at Harvard now for three years and I've been going out of my mind. If I went to Saul, if I said to him, hey, you want to know something? I just found out the world's going to end the day after tomorrow. He'd look at me and say, Jesus, you full of shit. Boy, you better see it shrink fast. You need a spinal test. You're really wing-wing. Boy, you're, you've lost your debt, you know? But you wouldn't say that to me. None of you white professors would say that to me. You know what you'd say to me? Don't you think we ought to examine the evidence? This <laughs> has been driving me crazy. Now, this is what's been happening. You know that. Now, I just, uh, now this, until you whites learn to talk to blacks exactly as you would talk to other whites and stop all this tactics of, you know, got to talk in a certain way and be special nice. If a guy says it because he's black, why that makes it different, uh, and so on. And until a lot of you blacks learn, <coughs> time to talk to whites exactly as you talk to other blacks, it's going to be trouble in getting together. There's always trouble when you have communication problems. <laughs> and people are just afraid to come out openly and talk about it, you know? I know. Trust. 